What's up everybody? Thanks for tuning in to Epic Ever Media once again. Got another video for you. Let's get straight into it. Hailing from St. Louis, Missouri, the five-piece rap outfit St. Lunatics formed in 1993 and includes members Ali, Nelly, City Spud, Kiwan, and Murphy Lee. Ali started out as a manager. Three more heads was T-Love, Yellow Mac, and Ali. They was managers. Mm -hmm. They was managers. They wasn't in this group. So when they say the Lunatics did all the legwork and they was doing all the talent shows and all of that, that was us. He didn't do that. When we was going around town making a name for ourselves, Shout out to D2. doing 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 <laughs> Eleanor car wash, the my mama car wash, that mm -hmm. was us. Performing at the talent shows at, at Forest Park, at the at the college, that was us. Mm -hmm. In 1996, the group recorded their debut single, "Give Me What You Got," which turned into a regional hit, selling 8,000 copies and receiving frequent airings on the St. Louis FM station 103 The Beat. Another member who joined the St. Lunatics group in 1996 would be member Slow Down, performing as a mass hype man. While Slow didn't actually record vocals or write lyrics, his energy and stage presence definitely helped Nelly and his fellow St. Lunatics to get signed in 1996 soon after he joined the group. After the St. Lunatics made their initial splash with the single Give Me What You Got, which received massive local airplay in 1996, the group had a deal with D2 Entertainment, a St. Louis studio slash label venture owned by twin brothers David and Darren Stiff. So we get with D2, we working, boom, 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 boom. Ali does a song called Give Me What You Got. Mm -hmm. Give a nice me song. What you got. Nice song. Nice song. Nice song. Nice song. Give me what you got. Dope. He killed it. He killed it. All right. Now, I come in, I hear, I put my verse down. No problem. The song, um, I get a call, because we talking about, I guess they talking about putting the song out um, as a singer. So I get a call from my lead, says, yo, you need to come up here. They about to kick you off the song, meaning D2. Like, why they about to kick me off the song? Well, they about to kick you off the song because you ain't signed the contract. Wait a minute. What I mean, I ain't signed the contract. I thought that we ain't signed the contract. We a group. Mm. I thought we all was going to sign these contracts together. Mm. Right. So but when neither a second regional hit title, Who's the Boss, made it happen for them, the St. Lunatics started looking for new connections, eventually hooking up with then- Mace manager who convinced them to single Nelly out and shop to major labels. Kuda Love would be the name of that manager. Mace say, give the tape to Kuda. Kuda Love. Kuda Love takes the tape. He leaves. He pops the tape in on the way back to the hotel, wherever, wherever he was going. He listening to it. He like, boom. He hit love back. He's like, yo, uh, if y'all can get up to New York, um, we can get the studio. I got a studio. We can go. We can make some songs. Okay, cool. Right? Now, mind you, we've been signed since this was like 96. This is like 98. This is like 98. Late 98 at that. After that. After we started getting back, right? So, we get back. No, about the middle of 98. So, we get back together. We scrounge up. We fly to New York. We go to record with Cool to Love. We do, we spent about two days in the studio. We do probably about four or five records. Kuda was like, okay, cool, no problem. He gonna see, he took the songs and was trying to shop them himself. Still can't get no bites. So about a month or two go past, Kuda doing that. He said, yo, let me tell you what, uh, I don't know about getting the group a deal, but I think I can get Nelly. I think, you know what I'm saying? I think I can get So it was, it was, it was, it was Kuda idea to get you the deal. Sure enough, in 1999, Nelly signed the Universal Records on the condition that they also signed the St. Lunatics as a group, making sure that he would look out for his lunatic brothers. Prior to Nelly's signing with Universal, he would move to New York City's Harlem with Mace and Kuda Love. I was in New York trying to get this record deal, and I used to hang with my, my man Cardan and Sugar J and all these Harlem World Cats at the time. I just had that, that country grandma. You know, I was the one that was around, and you know, once I talk, everybody kind of looked at me, you know what I'm saying? Like, yo, what you just say? 
I wrote this country grammar. Yeah, you know, and if you can't stand in that country grammar, man, that, <laughs> and that's kind of, you know, what took the whole shape and just putting a title on how I was basically bringing myself to the music industry. Their city spud would also join him, flying back and forth from Missouri to New York to help Nelly prepare for his new album. Spud appeared on Nelly's breakthrough hit single, Ride With Me, and was working with St. Lunatics on their debut album when he was sentenced to 10 years in prison for his minor role in a violent armed robbery in St. Louis. Ironically, he was a quiet, music-obsessed kid with no prior criminal record who handed himself in and cooperated fully with the police but fell prey to Missouri's tough sentencing laws. Shortly after Spud was jailed, Nelly would explode onto the charts as well as the St. Lunatics who titled their album Free City, paying homage to their fallen comrade City Spud. Following the success of Country Grammar and Free City, the Lunatics would then begin to focus on solo careers, beginning with Murphy Lee. Nelly would be approached by Jermaine Dupri to feature on the hit single, Welcome to Atlanta Remix. But because Nelly would be overwhelmed with all the success that he was having from Country Grammar, he would decline the invitation and pass it on to fellow lunatic Murphy Lee. Murphy Lee would join Jermaine Dupri on the Welcome to Atlanta Remix and would become the first solo act out of the St. Lunatics following Nelly's original solo career. Because Murph album came out after Nelly did. After we did Nelly did, and that's when Murph album came out, what the hook gonna be and all, and, and all that. He smashed it, went platinum, <laughs> killed it. Platinum man. Murph, Murph did his thing. In 2003, Murphy Lee and Jermaine Dupri would form a chemistry and Murphy Lee would be signed to Jermaine Dupri's then So So Death records label. Murphy Lee would follow up with the hit single, What The Hook Gon' Be, featuring Jermaine Dupri off the album, Murphy's Law. Uh, Lee would also embark on a solo career. He would debut his studio album, Heavy Starch, which was released in 2002 through Universal Records, featuring the hit single, Bougetto, which also featured Murphy Lee. Ali would also go on to team up with Big Gip, the legendary rapper from the iconic group Goody Mob. Ali and Gip would release the hit single Grills, which would feature Nelly and Paul Wall off the hot album Kinfolk, which would be released in August of 2007. Key One and Slow Down would not release any solo project. After some time, Slow Down would no longer be a part of the St. Lunatics. In 2010, Slow Down would make comments about the St. Lunatics. Any one of them cats will tell you I was the most loyal in that camp. And seeing with my own eyes that they don't understand what loyalty is. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So I don't know. I guess that's why St. Louis ain't getting proper, the proper you know what I'm saying? The dude, the dude the, not, not even information, like just the dude. Nelly, we, we support you, not support us. Which Nelly would rebuttal in an interview. You see what I'm saying? That's what people don't understand. Like, we were way before Slowdown. By the time we met Slowdown, we almost had a deal. We Universal. You see what I'm saying? Like, that, that, it, it, people need to know the history. Because you do get some people like, oh, man, how could you do them like this? Okay, well, let me give you the history on it. St. Lunatic's been together since 93. You see what I'm saying? We've been doing this 93, 94, 95. We probably got up with Slowdown, what, all of about 97? We started in a barbershop called Leroy's. We didn't meet Slowdown till the, um, Keith and Ali stopped working at Leroy's and went to work at another barbershop. And then that's when they bumped into Slowdown. You see what I'm saying? Tensions would begin to rise within the St. Lunatics. Ali would continue to tour with Nelly and would be named president of Nelly's Dirty ENT record label. Free City would be the only album released by the St. Lunatics. Throughout time, each of the St. Lunatics would continue to work on their solo projects. As time would pass and we wouldn't hear much from the St. Lunatics as a group, in the summer of 2020, Nelly would celebrate the 20th anniversary of Country Grammar, the album. Nelly would be booked in July for the Live Nations Live from the Drive-In Concert Series at Hollywood Casino Amphitheater. The night reached epic status when Murphy Lee 
Kiwan, City Spud, and Slow Down all performed with Nelly unannounced. It was a reunion no one could have predicted, but that we all needed. Noticeably, missing was Ali, who'd been by Nelly's side more than anyone the past 20 years. Wait, so with Country Gamma, I'm trying to find a good song, Country Gamma. So Nelly, that's his verse, the second verse. So right when you get to um uh, uh, um pretty much can be wild niggas fine niggas riding we riding running over the club busting in the crowd niggas high niggas ask me again it's going down nigga now they come to circus and watch me clown niggas fine niggas we begin again now niggas say now he hoes going to play now a now ready to cut you up any day now that was it because originally it said day ready to cut you up any day now I'm going down down baby yo you know what I'm saying but that was the pre the pre previous song when it was really a lunatic song it was Kiwan's eight bars my eight bars. Nelly's eight bars right there, and then Murph came in and said, uh, man, man, let me just Millie Young, this kid here, nothing silly, my kid, quicker than Billy, man, talking for me, I need that mom, flow like he's in really, man, that's when y'all read me, man, keys to my, be my mom, holler at Beanie, man, it was, that was Murph verse. So it was all together, it was just a real short song. It was me and Kiwan, them two, it was a real short song. The next morning following the reunion, Ali would go on to announce his retirement from the rap game and the group St. Lunatics. Nelly would continue with his country grammar anniversary year, which would include Dancing with the Stars, American Music Awards, and Good Morning America appearances. The St. Lunatics should be considered one of the greatest rap groups of all time. Hopefully they can mend their differences and give us fans another hot album. Shout out to the St. Lunatics. Cannabis is a Jamaican-born American rapper and actor who initially gained fame in the 1990s for his ability to freestyle impressively and eventually released his debut album, Can I Bust, in 1998. Jermaine Williams, better known as Cannabis, was born on December 9, 1974 in Kingston, Jamaica. The family moved frequently, living in the Bronx, Newark, New Jersey, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, Miami, Buffalo, and London due to his mother's career requiring constant relocation. Cannabis stated that he was once an introverted kid growing up. Soon after, hip-hop would become the guiding force in Cannabis's life. After completing high school in 1992, Cannabis spent a year working for AT&T and another year as a data analyst for the U.S. Department of Justice. His interest in computers and the internet led him to study computer science at DeKalb College in Atlanta. I graduated from high school in 92, then I, then I went into the workforce. I worked for AT&T my first year, and second year I went to the United States Department of Justice in the Economic Litigation Division. And being there, I had to use the internet because I had to go on there and, and download information for the, for the, you know, I was a data analyst and I had some, that was my occupation, that's what I had to do. Cannabis began rhyming in the early 1990s, and by 1992, under the name Cannabis Sativa, and formed a duo called Them, T-H-E-M, the Heralds of Extreme Metaphors, with Atlanta rapper Webb, now called CI, also known as Central Intelligence. In 1996, Them split and Cannabis teamed with businessman Charles Soup. That same year, Charles Soot introduced Cannabis to platinum producer Frankie Cutlass, and the two collaborated on a song. Cannabis also appeared on the Music Makes Me High remix by the Lost Boys featuring the Dog Pound, making it Cannabis' first official appearance on a record. Of the several guest appearances, 4321 certainly meant the most as it brought together most of NY's preeminent hardcore rappers and thus ushered cannabis into that same elite class. 4321 was a track from LL's album Phenomenon, which featured cannabis, Method Man, Red Man, and DMX. Cannabis and LL would end up in a feud over the verse that cannabis gave on LL's track 4321. Cannabis' verse began with the line, Yo LL, is that a mic on your arm? Let me borrow that. Referring to the microphone tattoo on LL Cool J's arm, which LL Cool J interpreted as cannabis and seltzer. When the final cut of the song came out, it featured LL Cool J's verse 
after cannabis is mocking an unspecified person which everybody believed to be cannabis at the same time cannabis would lash out shortly afterward with the mike tyson featured song second round ko where he rhymed the entire song dissing ll cool j let the world know the truth you don't want me to shine you studied my rhyme then you laid your vocals after mine who rapper would do so when you say that you platinum you only dropping clues i studied your background read the book that you wrote researched the footnotes about how you used to sniff coke fronting like a drug-free role model you disgust me you smoke weed recently you walk around showing off your body cause it sells plus to avoid the fact that you ain't got skills mad at me cause i kicked that 99% of your fans wear high heels from ice t to kumo v to jay-z now you wanna f see you dripping with whack juice and you can't get it off you better be prepared to finish with your start and give me the respect that I deserve. Well, I'ma take it by force. Blast you with the 45 Colt. Make you somersault. Shock you with a couple hundred thousand volt thunderbolts. Before you wanted the war. Now you wanna talk. It's about who strikes the hardest. Not who strikes first. That's why I laugh when I hear that whack. Crime I ever heard in my life. Cause the greatest rapper of all time died on March 9th. God bless his soul. Rest in peace, kid. It's because of him now at least I know what beef is. It's not what I would call this. See, this is something different. A fact of a dissing. Somebody that mm. he gotta know is better than him, but he feeling himself because he got more cheddar than him. Well, let me tell you something. You might got more cash than me, but you ain't got the skills me. <laughs> and if you really want to get it on, we can get it on. Live in front of the cameras on your own sitcom. I'll let you kick a verse. You kick them all. I'll even wait for the studio audience to applaud. Clap, clap. Now watch me rip the tap from your arm. Stick you in the groin. Kick you in your Vanguard Award. Snatch your Vanguard Award in front of your mom, your first, second, and third born. Make your wife get on the horn. Call Minister Farrakhan. Oh, no. Make your wife get on the horn. Call Minister Farrakhan so he can persuade me to squash it. I say, no, nah, he started it. He forgot what a hardcore artist is. A hardcore artist is a dangerous man such as myself, trained to run 20 miles of soft sand. Or the off-land, programmed to kick hundreds of balls off-hand from a lost and forgotten land. You done did it, man. You done spit it some probably thought that because it's been a minute, I forget it. Cause like Common and Cube, I see the you. And I'ma make the world see it too. The song was a feature of Cannabis' debut album, Can I Bust, which was released on September 8, 1998. It was produced by Wyclef Jean from the Fugees, with the video feature featuring Wyclef and a cameo appearance by boxer Mike Tyson. Despite the album being certified gold, critics were panned the album, criticizing both Cannabis' subject matter and Wyclef's beats most of which were considered inferior to both Second Round KO and the artist's previous collaborations. Shortly after the release of Second Round KO, LL Cool J sought his revenge, releasing The Ripper Strikes Back on the 1998 soundtrack Survival of the Illis, and thus channeling even more attention toward cannabis. LL unleashed a fury of insults and threats the media elevated the battle to grand heights and even MTV gave the story headlines. The Ripper Strikes Back found substantial acceptance at the time and Cannabis would end up on the losing side of the MC battle. The album Can I Bust would also lose its momentum and because Wyclef produced the majority of the tracks on Can I Bust, Cannabis would blame Wyclef for the dissatisfaction of the album and cut ties with him, even going as far as to diss Wyclef, most notably on the title track of his second record album, You Mad at the Last Album. Over the next two years, the rapper maintained a low profile in contrast to the regular guest appearances he had made leading up to his debut. And as a result, when he finally did return with his 2000 follow-up album, 2000 BC, 
he didn't have the same level of mainstream clout and the album was not promoted heavily. The album 2000 BC featured the first collaboration between Cannabis and Corrupt, Razzcats, and Killer Priest, a rap supergroup collectively known as the Horsemen, referring to the four horsemen of the apocalypse on the well-known underground track Horse Mentality. Of course, we got the horsemen, you understand me? We got Razzcast, we got Killer Priest, and we got Corrupt Young Gotti. Cannabis is right now out of town doing work, you dig what I'm saying? But we over here doing it big, man. This is the all-star cast up in here, bitch. Cannabis subsequently returned to the underground after parting ways with Universal. Cannabis continued to record albums and released them on the independent circuit. The albums included 2002's Mike Club, the first released on his own Mike Club Music record label in 2003's Rip the Jacker and 2005's Mind Control. During this time, Cannabis also served in the US Army and he was just as productive following his discharge and released several additional sets in the following years. In 2001, Cannabis released his third album titled C True Hollywood Stories. The title and some of the content deriving from the television show E! True Hollywood Story was released on Archives Music, an independent label owned by Cannabis's future business partner, Louis Lombard III. After C! True Hollywood Stories failed to meet expectations, Cannabis was subject to criticism and ridicule from the rap industry until the release of Mike Club, The Curriculum his fourth full-length album. The album was released towards the end of 2002 and although the production was handled almost entirely by little-known producers, some of them from Europe, the record proved to be a much greater critical success than the previous year's album's release. Mike Club also saw Cannabis return to a more complex rapping style with a number of concept tracks and few songs with the chorus. The album was released on Mike Club Music, Cannabis' own label, but failed to chart, selling relatively few copies. Following the release of Mike Club The Curriculum, Cannabis announced that he would join the United States Army. Before commencing his work with the military, however, he recorded a number of tracks which he intended to be released on his next album titled Rip the Jacker, Stoop the Enemy of Mankind, was given the task of producing the entire record, equipped solely with Cannabis' pre-recorded vocals. Due to his military obligations, Cannabis himself only managed to review the album after having acquired a copy. Unlike Mike Club, Rip the Jacker charted on both Billboard's R&B slash hip hop charts and the Billboard 200, peaking at number 34 and number 197, respectively, although commercially it retained a tendency to sell few copies. Following Rip the Jacker, Cannabis would be released from the army and an album entitled Mind Control was released in 2005. Cannabis had never planned for it to be compiled as a separate record, but agreed to release it through the independent Gladiator music label as part of a contractual agreement. Most of the vocals for Mind Control had been recorded prior to the release of C. True Hollywood Stories, a collection of previously recorded material with only three of the songs being unreleased, produced entirely by Mark Sparks. The album failed to chart and is rarely considered an official cannabis release by the rapper's fans. Also in 2005, a collaboration between cannabis and underground rapper Phoenix Orion, who had also been known for scientific lyrics, recorded the album called Def Con Zero, released on the independent Head Trauma Records label, owned by K1 kickboxer Dewey Cooper. The record featured guest appearances from Cool G Rap, K Solo, and former 106 and Park host Free, amongst others. In the same year, Cannabis's seventh solo album, Hip Hop For Sale, was released. The production on Hip Hop For Sale was handled in part by Virginia-based producer Knotts. In January 2007, Cannabis announced that he would release new material 
exclusively on his own imprint, Mike Club Music, in a joint venture with Legion Entertainment and distributed via his former major label, Universal Music Group. A pair of mixtapes titled Nothing to Prove and Nothing to Lose were slated for a release in March 2007, but were eventually scrapped instead. Cannabis decided to use the best material from each mixtape to create a new full-length album entitled For Whom the Beat Tolls. For Whom the Beat Tolls was originally set for release in May 2007, but was pushed back one month and a release on June 12, 2007 would be the new date, though it was not distributed by Universal as previously reported. Following the release of For Whom the Beat Tolls, Cannabis went on a sporadic tour in the U.S. to promote the album. In December 2009, Cannabis announced he would release his ninth studio album, Melatonin Magic. Melatonin Magic was released on February 9, 2010 to relatively positive reviews, being regarded as one of his most focused efforts yet. The album included several guest appearances, a marked contrast to the many of his previous albums in which he kept features at a minimum. Cannabis would release Sea of Tranquility on October 5, 2010. The producers would include DJ Premier, Irv Gotti, Jake One, Scram Jones, The Business, and Jay Zone. In 2011, Cannabis would release Lyrical Law, which was originally intended to be a Melatonin Magic remix album. As more and more guests were invited to feature, Cannabis decided to also record new material for the album and it quickly evolved into an official solo album. And in April 2011, it was announced that he would be selling the album through his new website, CannabisCatalog.com, in order to have more control over promotion and sales. In 2012, Cannabis would join King of the Dot in the Battle Rap League vs. Disaster. On June 9, 2012, Cannabis participated in the first two rounds and controversially resorted to pulling out a notepad to read his bars during the third round. After admitting defeat and wishing to recite what he said were 30 pages of rhymes that he had failed to memorize. The battle was part of King of the Dots Fresh Coast Division in LA. The Diplomats, also known as Dipset, is a hip hop group formed in 1997 by childhood friends Cameron and Jim Jones in Harlem, New York. The group was the original composition of Cameron, Jim Jones, and Freaky Ziki. Freaky Ziki, hype man, road manager, whatever else need to be done. Family, it's my cousin. It's all family right here. That's basically what you're going to see when you see me. You love it. right here. Jim Jones, what's poppin'? I do it all. You see me with my man, that's my partner. You know, prime it out, dime it out. Right now, we about to puff on some haze. Well, simple. Lightness is what we call it, really, though. Right. So, Cam, man, we ain't seen you in a minute. What, what, you, what you been into? All of whom grew up together in Harlem. Honey, you already know we gonna get to Dipset, Taliban, Source, all access. Let's get ready to go shop in Harlem. Get ready to go in my people's store. This is called hip hop. Right now we are we in my store. This is my people's right here. Hey yo, this is my boy Jay right here. This is where I go shopping at. You see everybody in the store. Love us because they know us, you know what I'm saying? We got promotional stuff out there. And this summer, we going to take advantage with the whole diplomat, Cameron, Joel, Jimmy situation. So it's going to be ugly up there. That whole hard 45th thing ain't going to be nothing but Cameron, diplomat, everything, posters. That's our spot. And in 1999, fellow Harlem-based rapper Joel Santana joined the group. This is my Yo, Joel, Joel, spit. Yo, yo, I get high with my older nigga. Flip pies with my chosen nigga. And I die with my soldier n Spit venom with my cobra n Jewel's mother I told you nigga 
can't stop the copper topper when I stop dropping pop ya right. Peel off in the drop with the top dropped and watch ya Woo. Body shaking, body aching, body get out the car, hit him again cause he probably faking You gotta make sure you stay raw uh. whether you living out here or behind the state walls Woo. And I love it when y'all say the rich get richer right. All that mean to me is that the clips get bigger, bigger. Know what it is, hate to see me stroking your wigs Come Wiz. in the house, I'm on the couch holding your kids Got niggas Coke spot, shoddy pumping, and then pump, pop pump, my gun and they gon' body I something. Did. Smoke the bomb till I hear the smoke alarm. Pop, shall hold the dawn. Yeah, that's the uh. The Diplomats' first commercial appearance as a group was on Cameron's 2000 album SDE Sports, Drugs, and Entertainment, released on Epic Records. That's basically, it, you know what I mean? I switched over labels, I'm on Epic now, so I just became familiar with everybody up there. So it was kind of a hard transition because they had to learn me, I had to learn them, and right now everybody's on the same page, so everything's going smooth now, but it took a few months to get it together, you know? So Cameron would eventually be released from Epic Records and he would go on to sign with Rockefeller Records which was owned by his childhood friend Damon Dash. Being in bitches and among other things and rap producer Damon Dash, a co-founder of Rockefeller Records together with Mr. Thomas L. Why are you You're looking at a prince Why you don't want to let him talk? You mad, you mad, you mad. Where'd you, get from? Where'd you start? Current the fear, right? No, wrong. Well, you're you looking, you're looking I got at a dirt man. on you, doggy. Cameron, just I'm going to get at you in a minute. You go ahead, you get at I'm going to get at you in a minute. Listen. Cameron released his third album, Come Home With Me, through Rockefeller Records. I'm with Cameron and Jay-Z in the yeah, house. Yeah, I was sick. Uh -huh. You got a new movie coming out called Paid In Full, directed by Dame Dash. Can you tell us about the role you play in it in the movie? Um, I play a dude called Rico. It's like, he's really Alpo. You know, it's based on... Um, these three dudes from Harlem, teenagers that was getting well, like millions on the hustling side of thing, thing. So it's like I played like I'm like old dog 2002. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> if you ever see Men's to Society, I play like the wild, crazy villain in there. You know, it's directing. Di Dame ain't direct that. Mm -hmm. Rockefeller produced it. Um, Dame directed a joint called Paper Soldiers. Okay. And when is Paid in Full come out? Um, September 13th. Okay. The, the album featured numerous guest appearances from Joel Santana and Jim Jones. The lead singles were Platinum Hits, Old Boy, and Hey Ma, which both featured Joel Santana. The album served as both an introduction to the Diplomats as a group and a stepping stone for the rest of the group to be signed to Rockefeller as individual artists. Following up with the success of Cam Ron's Come Home With Me album, Diplomatic Community introduced the entire Dipset squad, including Joel Santana, Jim Jones, Freaky Ziki, Ankasa, and Hell Rel, who was incarcerated by the time the album was available for purchase. The album would feature production from the Heat Makers, DR Period, and the then unknown Kanye West. With a unique blend of sounds from the production team, the album would push Dipset to the forefront of the creative curve of hip hop, which gave them an almost cult like following. The album was filled with a long list of hits, such as I Really Mean It, the most infamous Dipset anthem, and the lady friendly Hey Ma. Master P would also assist with Bout It Bout It Part 3. The album was considered average commercially debuting at number 8 on the Billboard 200 and selling 92,000 copies in its first week, but the album was still certified gold by the RIAA in 2005. And according to the streets, the album was a certified platinum hit. By the time of the release of their 2004 follow-up album, Diplomatic Community 2, additional members Hell Rel, 40 Cal, and J.R. Ryder had officially joined the group. Yeah, I to stop fronting to me. No, you not to connect. You can't front me a key. Listen, a picture. I'm something to see. I did two bids. Jail ain't nothing to me. I kill you if I get caught. That means somebody ratted. Here I go. Back up north. State greens with them crackers. No, 
I can't see it, homie. I got these D's on my back, but I could really get you weight if you need it, homie. And you ain't ballin', I snatch you out the Dodge Magnum. 44's poppin', see if you could dodge Magnums. Goons run down on you, get head start flashing. While you taking off the chain, I'm in the car laughing. I find it so funny, you ain't getting no money. This rap Ramadan, why so hungry? You ain't knocking my hustle, I send a dope fiend that you get you shot for a bundle. These bearmen just can't stand it, cause I'll be out the country, trying to put your grandma and your nana in a sandwich. They scrambling like damn it, cause 2005 I was riding up and down Carabana and a vanquish. Drop top Bentley, chop top twins, split your head, infrared, sock clock semi. I wrap around me, fast for wine, jeweler throw me watches. Hey, I'm catching time. Check my hat design. You come by, you get it. This that custom made new ever Raiders fitted. I was busy putting out albums and stacking up figures. Tell the truth, you was me. Would you be bad? Do 40 on another caliber. You just a lame in the game and state pop. You're playing yourself like game and state props. So I go upside his face with the razor blade ox, but next time is on his neck like a flavor flavor clock. The Diplomats will go on to focus on their solo careers as individual artists. The Dips wouldn't release an album since Diplomatic Immunity 2. And in June 2010, the Dips announced a reunion which began with a teaser titled Under Construction and a street single titled Salute, produced by A-Rab Music, being released. The song features Jim Jones, Cameron, and Joel Santana. Although we wouldn't get another album, the group hosted a reunion concert in New York on March 25, 2013 to celebrate the 10-year anniversary of Diplomatic Immunity's release. Fast forward to November 15, 2017, Jim Jones announced on his Instagram page that a new Diplomat single was to be released that same night titled Once Upon a Time featuring him and Cameron. And on November 22nd, 2017, the Diplomats revealed on MTV's TRL that they would be releasing an EP along with the documentary in the near future. Yes, we, 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 proud, we proud to have y'all. Y'all got some legends right here. Most definitely. Yeah. Now, Dipset is one of the most celebrated crews in hip hop and you know, Y'all show genuine brotherhood. Like, how y'all managed to put the BS to the side and remain solid? Nah, man, we, 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 we had our trials and tribulations. You know, <laughs> a lot of things, you know, happened. But at the end of the day, the, that, that key word in there is brothers. So, you mm -hmm. know, brothers fight, brothers do a lot of things. But at the end of the day, we remain brothers and we come back and, you know. Most definitely, most definitely brotherhood. Now, and later that night, the group performed a one night only reunion concert at the Manhattan Center, where they were joined by fellow New York group ASAP Mob. During the summer of 2018, the Diplomats went on a US national tour entitled Dipset Forever. And on October 8, 2018, Jim Jones confirmed Dipset will be releasing a new album titled Diplomatic Ties on November 22, 2018, followed by a performance at the Apollo Theater in Harlem, New York the next day. Currently, the Dips are still active as solo artists and can also be seen as a group together in various videos online. Marshall Mathers III, known professionally as Eminem, is an American rapper, songwriter, record producer, and is one of the best-selling music artists of all time, with an estimated worldwide sales of more than 220 million records. Eminem signed with Dr. Dre's Aftermath Entertainment in 1999 and subsequently achieved mainstream popularity with the titled album, The Slim Shady LP. His next two releases, The Marshall Mathers LP in 2000 and The Eminem Show in 2002, were worldwide successes and were both nominated for the Grammy Award for Album of the Year. At age 14, Eminem began rapping with high school friend Mike Ruby. They adopted the names Mannix and Eminem, the latter of which stood for his initials and evolved into Eminem. Eminem would sneak into neighboring Osborne High School with friend and fellow rapper Proof 
for lunchroom freestyle rap battles. On Saturdays, they attended open mic contests at the hip hop shop on West 7 Mile, considered ground zero for the Detroit rap scene at the time. While struggling to succeed in the hip hop industry, Eminem was still appreciated and embraced by underground hip hop audiences. In 1988, he went by the name MC Double M and formed his first group, New Jacks, and made a self titled demo tape with DJ Butterfingers. In 1989, they later joined Basement Productions, who later changed their name to Soul Intent. Then in 1992, with rapper Proof and other childhood friends, they released a self titled EP. In 1995, featuring Proof. Eminem also made his first music video appearance in 1992 in a song titled Do Da Dippity by Champ Town. In 1992, Eminem signed with FBT Productions, which have been run by Jeff and Mark Bass. They are known as the Bass Brothers. Eminem will head to the Bass Brothers' basement to record Infinite. The debut studio album by Eminem. My brother was the individual that first recognized uh, the talent of Marshall. Heard him on the open mic night. Every Friday, Lisa Lisa would let us come down there. We we, we actually hooked it up to a guy named DJ Dick, who um, let us, we was known as Basement. I don't know, Dick, Dick told Lisa Lisa about us or whatever, and she said let him come down and let him rap. And one night, I guess Marky was coming home in his car and uh, heard us on the air and called up there. We was on the air while he, while he um, was making the call. He was We've like, got a whole party crew in the house tonight. Basement Productions here. What's up, fellas? What's up, Lisa? What up? How y'all doing? Not too bad. Not too bad? You want to say yo to some of y'all posse? All right. Okay. Eminem wants to send shouts out to uh, Vitamin C. <laughs> uh, Norris from Gibbs, Kim, DJ Dick, K-Hop, my mother, everyone else's mother. <laughs> Manix, Chaos Kid, DJ Butcher Fingers, who's sitting right here in the studio right now. Yes. Sherry. Oh. And uh, Joe, we appreciate this fine talents. And everyone I didn't send a shout out to, I probably forgot you. That's all right. Recording sessions took place at the Bass Brothers studio with production handled by Mr. Porter and Eminem himself with Proof programming the drums. The album features guest vocals from fellow rappers Proof, Mr. Porter, IQ, 3, and Time, as well as a singer, Angela Workman. Eminem purposely made infinite songs radio friendly in hopes of getting played on Detroit's radio stations. On November 12, 1996, Infinite was released by Web Entertainment. It's not exactly known how many copies Infinite exactly sold, and even Eminem stated in his autobiography, The Way I Am, that it sold maybe 70 copies. The Infinite record, uh, I think I was about 20, and had started going up to uh, a lot of open mic spots. Um, and one was called the Hip Hop Shop, you know, like the most infamous uh, open mic spot there was, especially at that time in Detroit. And uh, started going to them open mic spots and just making a name. However, other sources stated that the album sold a few hundred copies or even a thousand copies. Eminem's overall disappointment with Infinite's lack of success inspired him to develop his famous Slim Shady alter ego, which became present in his later works. Physical copies of Infinite were released on cassette and vinyl, and Eminem sold the copies from the trunk of his car in Detroit. It was the momentum of, of, of that. I think they figured if we put, if we press up another, another cassette, and some, uh, some LPs, some vinyl, and let the DJs play them in the clubs and shit at the same time, shop it, and we could get some. But nothing cracked again, and the album kinda <laughs> flopped again. By the end of 1996, the album was a commercial failure. In the spring of 1997, 
Eminem recorded the EP Slim Shady EP, which was released that winter by Web Entertainment. I don't know, a series of events, style changes, in my life, just drastic, just different. And the way I was rapping began to get more uh, hostile and more, you know. So I started coming in with songs like, it was talking about overdosing on drugs and, and life and this and that. And it caught their ear in a whole different way. Just like it started catching everyone else's ear, like wherever I was going, you know, rapping about it. And Eminem would part ways with FBT Productions and Web Entertainment. And in 1999, Eminem would sign with Dr. Dre's Aftermath Entertainment. And on May 14, 2009, This Is 50.com re released the album as a free download on their website to build anticipation for Eminem's sixth studio album, Relapse which would be his comeback album after a five-year hiatus. Yeah, it's Eminem coming straight for your face. Tell it with Pizarre and my man. Hey, yeah, One. giving him seeds the blues. Yeah, on the radio with my man DJ House Shoes. We house crews on the regular, making calls on the cellular, rearranging molecular structure. Ooh. With the flow that sucks you in every time and lays you in bed and tucks you. Yeah. 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 The fuck that. Eight yeah. MCs in the head with the crowbar. You chilling with Justin Kovar. Yeah. 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 Dirty dozen. The now this quarter boy on the beach. From the Dirty dozen. <laughs> pace one. Uh, Eminem. Pace one. Outsiders up in here. Dirty dozen. Expansion. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. We chilling with expansion. Yeah. Expansion. Yeah. You hear me? Your speaker. Expansion. Expansion. <laughs> 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 That's what he said. Peace, y'all. Yeah. All right. Take it easy. Yeah. We'll see y'all later. 40 Thieves is a Yonkers, New York based hip hop duo, originally a trio composed of King Kirk, aka Thieven Stilberg, Big Doobs, aka Safe Cracker, and Marlon Bryant Brando, aka Robin Hood. They're most known for their parody of TLC's hit No Scrubs titled No Pigeons, which attempted to tell things from the male perspective. And their song hit it up on the Best Man soundtrack. In 1999, TLC would cast the first stone in what would become a battle of the sexes between male and female with the song No Scrubs. I think there's all types of scrubs, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. In, the, in the song, we describe it as a guy who's usually sitting on the passenger side, waving at the females, trying to, you know, but has no life. But you also have the executive scrub. <laughs> <laughs> you have the scrub who is the C, the E, and the O. Okay? <laughs> so you can hang out like that. and four no, you can't. sizes. You, you, know, e you describe Smitty to a T. <laughs> <laughs> and they pretend things are theirs that it's not like you know they'll claim a girlfriend knowing they haven't went with them before you know the CEOs oh. <laughs> you know, we all know about the scrub Cher yeah. you know you've had an experience Cher with the scrub, scrub. Yeah. 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 Well, written by Candy Burris and Tamika Tiny Harris of the group Escape it was a playful yet realistic hit at good for nothing men with the blunt chorus TLC let the world know not only who and what they wouldn't tolerate, but why. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the biggest male disc record ever. What were you thinking? Yeah. What made you yeah. do it? Uh, an ex-boyfriend. I was just like freestyling, talking about him, really. Um, oh. Honestly, what happened was, okay, so initially, I used to have this like notepad that I would write down, like if it was a word or slang term or anything or a topic that I want to, that I thought would be a good song, I would always write them down. So I like, I had like a list of song titles that, you know, eventually like if I got to, you know, somebody sent me some tracks or whatever, I listed the beat up and like, ooh, that'll be good for this one or whatever. So, no, Scrubs was one of the 
titles that was in my notepad that I had been holding on to. So I remember when Tiny and I first met Shakespeare, he had, you know, we just, you know, were meeting him to get tracks from him or whatever. Mm. He had a different song to that track. And so we were like, I said, I like that track, but I think we could do a better, write a better song to it. And so right. he, he gave me that little like, yeah. Come on, right. so don't disrespect me. All right, well, you could try. That's how he was ahead, So he gave us the track, I left, whatever. Um, and I was, it was a couple days later, I was with one of my other homegirls and we was talking about these dudes that we was dating. And, um, I just started freestyling the first verse, that whole first verse hook or whatever. And um, I just uh, remember that we was laughing as I was freestyling the song mm -hmm. over to the track because I was playing the track while I was driving or whatever. I write my best in the car, by the way. Okay. So, <laughs> I just had like this envelope that I had. It was a tour envelope. I remember I was like, it's kind of dope. Let me write this down, you know, because it was a freestyle, but I was feeling it, you know, myself. I wrote it down on the envelope, and then um, the next time I saw Tiny, I was like, I got this idea. You're probably going to think it's crazy or whatever. And I sung it to her, and she liked it. She bust out laughing. Cause she the song would reach the attention of men worldwide. And in May of 1999, the hip-hop trio Sporty Thieves released a brash rebuttal titled No Pigeons. The rappers, whose debut album arrived the previous summer, had earned a minor buzz in New York for clever rhymes that showcased a brazen sense of humor. No Pigeons, which borrowed the same instrumental crafted for TLC's No Scrubs, was a testament to Sporty Thieves' sensibilities. Hitchhiking their wagon to one of the year's biggest songs was savvy, but Sporty Thieves had no idea that Counterpunch would mushroom into a hit of its own. No Pigeons topped both the Billboard Hot Rap Singles and Hot R&B slash Hip Hop Singles sales charts peaking at number 12 on the Hot 100. No Pigeons became so big that even women were loving it. No Pigeons absorbed the power of No Scrubs helping to create one of the more fascinating pop culture moments of 1999. One ignited the girls and one ignited the guys. Sporty Thieves would first grab hip hop's attention with their debut single in 1998 titled Cheapskate. The song Cheapskate was a mission statement informing women that they couldn't get over on the group. Cheapskate reached only number 31 on the Hot Rap Singles chart. The remix, dubbed even cheaper, peaked at number 27. No Pigeons was more of an extension of Cheapskate and its remix. For Sporty Thieves, everything would change after Funkmaster Flex put No Pigeons into rotation on Hot 97. No Pigeons quickly snowballed into a hit. According to a 1999 MTV News report, former Hot 97 program director Tracy Cloherty said the song was receiving roughly 40 spins a week. An impressive number for a group who had previously failed to gain significant radio traction. The song worked its way up the billboard charts, but its most impressive accomplishment by far was creating a situation where DJs had to play both it and No Scrubs in clubs. The music video for No Pigeons itself, a parody of Hype Williams' new millennial visuals for No Scrubs, received heavy airplay because as King Kirk explains, networks like MTV wanted both videos in rotation even back to back in some scenarios. BET even went as far as to edit both videos together into an extended clip. Seven minutes of gender war madness. The situation, as unexpected as it was, created the perfect setup for Sporty Thieves to further capitalize. In an effort to keep the momentum of No Pigeons going, Sporty Thieves also released a rebuttal to Destiny Child's hit Bills Bills Bills. Sporty Thieves would be struck by misfortune when Rough House Records ceased operation in May of 1999, just as the song was taken off. The album Street Cinema, which peaked at number 66 on Billboard's top R&B slash hip-hop albums chart, was repackaged with the addition of No Pigeon. 
Despite the success of No Pigeons as a single, the album Street Cinema, which was re-released, did not do commercially well. The most devastating blow to the Sporty Thieves, however, had nothing to do with music. It would be when group member Marlon Brando was killed after being struck by a van in the Bronx in May of 2001. Sporty Thieves also contributed to the Rockets Records compilation Hip Hop for Respect, a project put together by Most Def and Talib Kweli. In 2013, King Kirk released his new Sporty Thieves compilation album mixtape called Cinema Beats and Broads. Keep my eyes on what I feel is close to what I what I remember, or go back to what I remember and stand it like that. Oh, obviously my man Brand passing. You know what I mean? It's that. You know what I'm saying? Understanding damn a part of what got you to that level you wanted to get, you lost like a year or, that, or less later. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, damn, you get there with your brother, and then it's like, whew, get out of here. Not get out of here, but stop. And I say stop, not the game stops you, but your heart stops. You know what I'm saying? So it's one of them things that took me a long time to this day. And in 2014, Sporty Thieves released their official follow-up to their first album, Street Cinema Part 2. Early 90s was a great time for hip-hop rap because it was so diverse. It was extremely diverse. You had West Coast, you had East Coast, you had Gangsta, you had the Native Tongues, you had, you know what I mean? It was so much going on. You had um, you had uh, artists like Queen Latifah, you know, who artists like that we don't see anymore. You see, you see, everything is one-sided now. To where it's back in the late '80s, early '90s, it was very diverse. It was an open market. I mean, granted, a lot of artists weren't flourishing and eating, um, and they weren't they weren't as big as a, as a financial standpoint as you know towards the late '90s and early 2000s. But everyone was doing it for the love of the music they were enjoying creating good music it, it wasn't no set format it wasn't no set everyone has to talk about one thing which is you know is common now and a lot of music so that's what I, I really appreciate about music back then thanks for watching everybody please watch the playlist like share subscribe to the channel peace